Gotcha. Right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have questions for Todd. As you probably know, Vanessa, Todd and I uh, got together a couple of weeks ago and had a couple of nice days together. And I I went through some of these questions. Uh, I've read the book three times now, the Hegel uh, Emancipation book. Uh, okay. it, gets better, it gets better each time. But right. that also gives me more to try to grill him on each time. And I'd like it at the beginning to return to a a thing that we were starting to explore, Todd, and that's the chapter where you talk about love and 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 that being a pivotal uh, recognition by Hegel, leading to his his recognition uh, uh, that he develops in the logic. Uh, and I've been thinking about this more and more, and I think that what you formulate there is not only an ideal of what love would be, but it's also what people usually feel initially when they fall in love. They feel, oh yeah, I exist only for you and for the best for you and you for me. And we form this thing that's completely uh, unique, uh, the identity and difference, if you will. But I think at the same time, anybody who feels that ought to say, and look at the crap in myself I'm going to have to deal with if I'm going to try to live up to that ideal. What I'm trying to suggest is that maybe there's something uh, suspect about the ideal in terms of the way human, in terms of the things that love involves for human beings in 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 uh, in constituting uh, that relationship. You want to you want to go uh, anywhere? With that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But first, I want to, Vanessa, Vanessa, do you want to just start in Medias race like that, or oh, do you want to? Yeah. You do. That's okay. It. That's I love it. That's that's what rendering unconscious does. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> we have no rules so, here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that I, I talked to you about this a little bit in private, but uh, I think that's a pretty good I don't know, objection counterpoint to the the idea. But I I I guess what I would say is that uh, even in even when uh love is and, and i think you're right that, that that you experience that more that feeling of like i i i the other matters more than me right what or like mm -hmm. the like the identity of identity and difference is what how hegel puts it uh but you certainly experience that more in the beginning or you feel it i guess more in the beginning of love than you do uh later on but i i, I think what what's important for Hegel, and I think this is actually relates to psychoanalysis too, is that even w even in, the, in its most, I guess I would turn, I would flip your question. <laughs> for example, like, I think even in its most debased forms, lo that love relationship still has that element in it. And so uh, the, the question, I mean, I don't think that makes it necessarily yeah better for people but i think it i think the the point would be that okay i i have to like i'm i mean it can make it worse even like i i have to i see the thing in the other i i i see this thing in the other person that is more valuable to me than myself but i can't i can't uh i can't be the equal of that right like i can't and i think oftentimes that uh maybe this is the most prominent experience in love is that we feel like we're not the equal of our own experience of or, or uh idea of love right like that we just uh we, we 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 come short of the very thing that is driving us and i think that i think that happens all all the time i guess that's what i would that's what i would I like, say i'd like to pick up on that because yeah i think about the ideal and i have immense respect for it i think it's a very sad concept ultimately, because I think our primary experience of that ideal is that we don't live up to it. And, uh, and I think we frequently don't live up to it because perhaps we don't understand it in the proper way. That thing to me means I've got to be ruthless with myself and with the other in tearing away anything in either of our psyches that would uh, make it impossible for us to try to live out that idea. So it, it almost to me is like Hegel's, and this relates to a 
question I want to ask you about Hegel as psychoanalyst, but it's almost as if that ideal opens us to psychoanalysis. I think that's true. I mean, I think probably, look, the, the it, it seems to me clear that two things, like the idea of dialectics is Hegel's main push toward psychoanalysis and the unconscious. But I would say equally, I think his his thinking about love and the way that I mean, this is one of the arguments in the book for people that don't have time to read a book on Hegel or don't want to. Uh, <laughs> don't say that uh, about your book. Uh, no, have time no, to read no. it. I, mean, I don't know that I would. A world read. enough in time. I don't know that I would want to read it. But uh, again, for sure. Uh, but I think that the, Hegel's I, my idea in the book is that Hegel's thinking about the concept, how he understands the concept, is based on his initial theorizing of love, which he, he did about uh, eight, nine yeah. years before he wrote the Phenomenology of Spirit. So so the, the idea is that for Hegel, the concept is what creates an identity, but it also has to include difference in it as well. And this has been the source of several critiques of Hegel by like Bertrand Russell. He just They just say Hegel didn't really understand how the concept functioned, but I think it's a genuinely incredible theoretical invention or discovery on Hegel's part, incredible. But it, but my one of my arguments is that it has its basis in, in his earlier theorization of love. The thing that's incredible to me about it, uh, and I won't go on to the, this because I want to get, is that he brings that concept, that concept of love to the center of philosophy and right. tries to and tries to say, this is what enables me to philosophize in a way that Kant couldn't. Right. And I mean, in a way that Kant and Fichte could. And I think it's really so. So Perfect. just for people, because not people aren't going to know who Fichte is necessarily. But so Fichte is Kant's immediate follower and in certain ways is one of the most revolutionary thinkers in the history of philosophy. But, but, but his idea was that everything that we encounter in the world has its this also kind of psychoanalytic idea, I think, has its value for us because we posit it as value. So. He thinks that everything, and he didn't think the I creates everything, but he thinks we give things value through our self, what he called our self-positing of the I. And so, but but you, you see that the problem becomes immediate, like immediately evident, I think, like how do you account for then like genuine otherness that really resists? And all, all Fichte can say is, well, we posit this not I as well, but Hegel's the first one to say, no, there really is this encounter with otherness that has to be thought of philosophically and so mac i think you're right to say that that's really he's like that 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 really puts you on a path to psychoanalysis right when you when you bring that in a way that you're right like kant or fichte they couldn't and even shelling i think to, to some a greater or lesser extent couldn't think that let me take that one step further because i think the person who most drives hegelian thought into human experiences, consciousness experience, is Sartre. And Sartre, of course, argues in the chapter on concrete relations with others that love is impossible because, right. of, because of his concept of what it would mean to try to grant the other their freedom as the recognition of your freedom, et cetera. So I'm wondering if this is also connected to your idea that we're constantly discovering contradictions if we're thinking in a Hegelian fashion. Yeah, I think so. Like, and I think that this is a, to me, this is a limitation of Sartre's thinking about contradiction, right? Like he doesn't see the way, like for Hegel, thinking about contradiction is is the way that one uh, connects with others, right? Like, like the contradiction one... connects, right? Like, like contradiction sure. isn't the, isn't for him, the, it's, it's a failure, yes, but it's also like the mode of, it's a, like one of the things he does is he takes failure and sees the way in which failure always houses a kind of success. Yeah. And I think that's what he would say about contradiction. I think that's what he would even say about love back to your original question, Mac. Like, I think he would say, well, okay, it's precisely in those failures that that's where we have to see the, yeah, the success, right? Like that's the success. So it's not like it's like, or it's like one way to think of it psychoanalytically would be like, don't think of this, moment of a terrible fight as the worst moment in the oh. relationship like oh. think of it as like that's where like our love really showed itself right, right. like i think that's a that seems like to me a perfectly hegelian it puts itself to the test yeah 
this connects with, and it's another thing, as you know, given my own work, I'm fascinated by the way in which you are connecting Hegel on contradiction and Hegel on drama. Uh, because I think that's precisely, drama is precisely that kind of thing where the conflict, the, con the, the clash, the crisis, all that, that's the most fruitful development. That's, that's how what's really there is going to be, is going to come out. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that that's right. I mean, the, the, the book that I'm working on in Hegel right now is on kind of on Hegel and drama, right? So... I think that that, and, and it's interesting that you, uh, you're, I want to plug Vanessa's book because oh, okay. I, think, I think Max's Thank essay you. on, on, mm. uh, on persona is really, uh, like it takes drama really as its point of departure, I think. And it's interesting because I, I, a couple of, I thought a couple of the essays in that collection are trying to think like, how is Bergman like representing uh, something dramatically for us in a way that uh, wouldn't work literarily, right? And so I think that I I, I think that, that that's for 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 Hegel. Like, what does drama let us see? Well, drama lets us see the way in which uh, something like if you just if you argue, this is why he's. I think he. This is what he. This is why people. I was just at a little Hegel symposium with some analytic philosophers and and. There were one of the, so the, a few of them like Hegel, but most of them hate him because what he does is he turns philosophy from argument to drama. Yeah. Right? And that is a real, like, if you dramatize something, then all of a sudden that's a different way, totally different way to think about philosophy than making arguments. And all of a sudden philosophy becomes more amenable to like fiction and life. Things right, life right, life. right. I know it's, it's interesting. So I'm the I'm the I'm the head of Where will this stop? television studies at, at University of Vermont right now. I'm, I was doing these things for admitted students, and guy comes in. He's like, you know, I just came from philosophy, and I told him I wanted to do continental philosophy, and they said, well, leave this room and go over to the film and television studies. So I thought that was very nice of them, but I thought it was very it was revelatory, right? I think if you want to do like philosophy as we think of it you can't do it in the philosophy department but i think it's because i think that hegel is the turn like hegel is the real turn away from that kind of i, I couldn't agree traditional more. Way i'm with philosophy. hegel <laughs> <laughs> i know i know by the way i want to get another plug in for vanessa's book there if you'll hold it up for a second i, I will hold it up again hold it up. Yeah, there no, the, reason, the reason i want to get the plug is uh I, I want to thank Vanessa for letting me write the article on Persona. Persona is my favorite movie. It's been that for ages. I never thought I'd get a chance to really write out what I uh, thought about it over many years. And so that was really, it's the only time I've written on film. And and I'm really glad that I had the chance to do that. It's also the I'm best so glad. <laughs> I'm so glad, and I'm so glad that Todd recommended you for the book. And I, like I said before, we were recording your book. Really, like, gives some life to that book, and like, you you really get into it. Whereas the other, a lot of the other essays are a little more like, yeah, analytical and looking at things. But yours is like, it's got some passion. It's got well, some it's verve. Got, it's got a lot. Of, <laughs> got a lot of See, I I mean, the, and Todd knows this very well from knowing me so many years. I'm an actor and a playwright and a novelist, as well as somebody who tries to think about these things. But I always bring that perspective to the thing that I'm that I'm trying to think about. And when I don't experience something as a drama, I think either there's something wrong with me or wrong with it. Well, uh, Vanessa, that, can I ask you, why didn't you write an essay for it? Um, I just... You know, I, I don't write about film. I've never written about film either. And I just got all, these are the ones that I got in, a lot of Swedish people, and it was kind of at the word limit. And I was like, that's fine. I'll just stick with the introduction. I didn't want, I didn't want to cut anyone out or cut anyone down to fit me in. So okay. I felt okay with that. Okay. okay. Yeah. I, I, would, I would add one final thing. There are many ways you can approach persona. You can approach it in purely cinematic terms and see incredible things that he's doing. I tried to approach it as a real complex human drama, thinking of the of, of Strindberg and Ibsen 
direct influence on Bergman and the ways in which he was trying to take that and and uh, and dramatize the complex relationship between these two psyches. That was do you think point. he's a more? Do you think he's a more? I I, th I really like what you're saying about the influence on him. And I, this is a question for Vanessa too. Like, do you think he's a more dramatic filmmaker than he is a cinematic one? Like, I feel like he's yeah. not the most cinematic. And I think Mac and I often. I mean, the, your essay begins with this: like, two things are now falling out of repute: existentialism right. <laughs> and Bergman. And I really liked that. But I I, I think that. Um, it's in, what's interesting to me is I t often teach uh, Jean Paul Sartre's existentialism is a humanism. This little pamp, it's kind of like a primer for being in nothingness. And students, a lot, like I teach it a huge class. Students universally love it. They think it's great. So I think, ex but I want. So I think existentialism still has some legs. I want to say. Tell but, them what Sartre thought of that essay. <laughs> I know Sartre did not love it, but but you know you don't get to decide. Uh, but. I, I when I show Bergman, it's not students don't like it. So I think it, they aren't they don't have the same kind of weight. And I, I wonder if it's if, if this dramatic kind of way. Of, like I think of also that, I mean I think of films that are based on uh, plays, right? Like uh, uh, like Mara Saad, you know, like I, that's an also a, a film that students do not like. And I wonder if if the if the more dramatic rather than cinematic nature makes it a little more difficult for uh people young at least younger people to watch now i, I so I'm, I'm curious to what either of you think but about it. I, I want you to develop that because i don't i don't understand what's happened to cinema to be honest with you uh so much of it has become uh either comic books that are that we can now yeah i don't mean that i don't care about that i that, that's when's not... the last time you saw a really good intense drama play itself out in a in a movie, I I don't see many. I thought France had this. France, yeah, France is good. Which um, reminded yeah. me at times of Bergman because there's a way in which I guess what I want to say is Bergman manages to create a cinema where he's taking us inside the lives of the characters. The woman uh, Paula Beer in France, uh, you learn so much about her inner life from the way she's filmed when she has no words at all. Uh, so that by the end, um, and this is something as a novelist, I really get picked off at cinema because I'd have to write a scene 20 pages to get, you know, to do the same thing that they can just do with a, with a gesture or a silence or things like that. Right. But I think what was great about Bergman is he made all of those things inherently dramatic in his films. Right, and he was a I, theater I, director, so it makes sense that his, things yeah, look, right. his films look like plays. I like films that are like, like that could be easily translated to plays or vice versa. Like last night we watched 12 Angry Men and I love like films like that. They're just set, set in one room and yeah, it's all about the dialogue. You watch the one with Henry Fonda and Lee Yeah. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. I always okay. yeah. thought that I didn't have a chance to play, uh, to be in a production of that play. Because so, Yeah, so I mean... That's Sidney Lumet's first movie. It's pretty great. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. Pretty. Uh, he's a great director. Uh, yeah, I think that that's, it's interesting though that you said this, this idea of like character, right? That, that for Bergman, character is the fundamental thing. And I think that's true. But, and, and, and I, I think that that, but that is precisely what I think people think is not cinematic about him, yeah. right? Like that, that, because in a, in a, I don't want to comment on contemporary cinema. I think I, I don't disagree with anything you said about the disaster. Uh, although I saw this thing, I, maybe you've seen it, Civil War. I just saw it, it, it's, it's quite not good. So I, I don't recommend it at all. Um, uh, but, but- uh, uh, More Things was good. I, I like I haven't, More Things is excellent. No, Poor I Things is excellent. I haven't Barbie yet, so. Yeah, yeah, Poor <laughs> Things. You can skip Barbie and Oppenheimer, okay. in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. But poor <laughs> things is quite good. I can skip the Scorsese film too, so that you just mm -hmm. saved four hours of my life. Yeah, <laughs> Oppenheimer's long, uh, but I, don't, I think that I think that though. Let me try to give you like, like just think of like the two greatest films maybe ever, uh, Potemkin and Citizen Kane, right? Like they in each case. Like Kane, it cares about the character of Kane, yeah. but it much is much more concerned with like the space around him, 
the the depth of field shot, the the angle of the camera, like all these questions, the lighting, like all these questions are so much more important for Wells every, than the character. Every, sorry, every shot in Citizen Kane is in one way about cinema. It's a, it's it's somebody who's saying I'm gonna sh I am going to show you the real way you can use all of these things if you want to. Right, which no one would ever say about Bergman. No, no, no one would ever say. So that's Bergman, Bergman. The furthest Bergman got experimentally was Persona. Right, right. Uh, exactly. You know, and that exactly. was as far as he yeah. wanted to go. He yeah. he would yeah. not see uh, all that. I mean, I love Kane because you can take that movie. And if you watch it enough times, you will know everything about what cinema can do. You don't need any other film. Right, right. Uh, right. But but I, I just think it's interesting to think about. I mean, I think that that limits. It's interesting, Vanessa, that you chose Bergman. I understand there's other reasons because you're living in Sweden. And, but, but to collect an <laughs> I essay I moved the on. same year as his centennial. And then my husband was like, oh, uh, you should do something on Bergman. And I was like, You okay. have to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me watch but the I whole think box that, set of his films, which was really interesting. Oh, you did. You watched straight through. We watched the whole thing. It was like a hundred year box set that came out, and oh. uh, a centennial anniversary. And we watched all of them. And his films like from the eighties and stuff, where they were in like color, and he was living in Germany. And Liv Ullman is like wearing this like crazy like clown makeup and as, as like a burlesque oh, yeah. dancer. And I was just like, what's going on here? <laughs> it's great. Wow. Wow. So, uh, but I just think that that's the difference to me, and I think it's it makes it, yeah. it makes it hard for people to to enjoy Bergman. I mean, Vanessa, it's interesting that you said you like the the filmed play it doesn't bother you. I think a lot of people that today at least are, are um, that, that, that I mean that to me it, it, it explains it like feels the really eclipse. forward to kids to younger people. Yeah, I think so. It just explains the eclipse of Bergman's popularity because when I was a kid. When I when Mac was my professor, I had, I mean, I wasn't a total kid. I was younger, but but Bergman was very popular. Like everyone, everyone saw all all the like major Bergman films, and and sure. I you know I direct this film. I'm in this film studies. Like I would bet zero of our best students even have seen one Bergman film. So yeah, a, a lot of people I know that are in that, that are like film people that do like film and psychoanalysis are like when I asked them about coming into the book, they were like, I don't really know much about Bergman. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, now you've made me realize too, Todd, though, I also didn't write anything for this book. I edited on violence with Manya, and I also didn't write anything for this book. I just turned in on uh, the queerness of psychoanalysis, and I'm realizing I think it's part of my neurosis or something that I just <laughs> want to like, just like the podcast, I want to showcase everyone. I don't need to yeah. talk. I just want to listen to you talk, you know, I'm like, I think that's what yeah. I do. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. Thanks for analyzing me. You did pick the correct profession. Though, yeah. You? I mean, yeah, I like yeah. to listen and see what everyone else is saying and facilitate yeah. them to keep speaking more. Yeah. Yeah. But then yeah. I wrote this novel that Max reading. So that's, maybe that's, that's, <laughs> that's what ends up happening. <laughs> You said a lot in that. Some people are going to say, no more speaking, Vanessa. <laughs> <laughs> After Hegel. Yeah. Like After I Hegel. said, I don't, I don't know if psychoanalysts are allowed to write books like that. that. Oh, I think they should. Because I remember uh, a meeting I was in once. Rick was in this meeting, Todd. And, Rick uh, Boothby. Uh, Rick Boothby. And there were about eight of us. I was the guest. And they were discussing things. And I tried to bring it into their experience. And Rick was the only person there who didn't say what the others said adamantly. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't. And it was about sexuality. And I said, well, I'm prepared to talk about my sexuality. Why aren't That's not what we're here for. So I, what I'm trying to say there was, there was that pose of mastery that made it uh, not... It wasn't unnecessary to talk about their sexuality. Uh, it, it was as if they simply felt it was out of bounds, that it was separate from their psychoanalytic mastery of that subject. And uh, well, Freud kind of thought that. 
well, he was wrong then. <laughs> I mean, don't you think? I think Freud, I think Freud but, sort of thought that, right? He I might mean, have thought, thought that, that. He might have thought that, but if a psychoanalyst is not, and I'm not just talking about the bullshit training analysis, I mean the ongoing self-analysis that any psychoanalyst should be doing, if they are not constantly interrogating their own sexuality, I don't know how they are able to do anything with their Yes, yeah, sex is kind of central. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, uh, but you, but it seems to me, uh, and and I, it it seems to me that the psychoanalytic uh, event, whatever you call it, the session is such that the psychoanalyst has to give up the pose of detached mastery, to among other things, to say there's all sorts of things that I don't understand. And maybe this person who's laying on the couch talking to me about theirs can give me an interaction where we can both uh, understand our experiences in ways that we hadn't. Uh, but I, I feel the sense, I felt at that meeting very much that that there was a strong defense in, in even opening up that issue as a possible uh, thing for psychoanalysts to be doing. Let, let me ask it another way. Hegel has, I want to, I want to get you to tell me what inwardness is for Hegel, innerlichkeit, I think, and and I want to connect it if you can to a statement he makes early in the phenomenology. I'm not quite sure where, but it's within the first 150 pages where he says consciousness is the absolute dialectical unrest. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. 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 When we're, uh, can you comment on that? On those two things, absolute dialect, conscious. What struck me about it was he didn't yeah. say the concept is. He said consciousness right. is. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I think I think that he. I think for him, inwardness is negation, right? Like I think that's why you know you mentioned Sartre's debt to Hegel earlier. I think that that's where it's really most evident that like conscious is that what it starts say it's like a annihilating nothingness right like that and i think that that's for hegel i think that that's what that's what inwardness is it's this precisely this negative relation to what is and 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 to see but also i think it's interesting i mean and this is going to sound contradictory i don't think it is uh but he also thinks and this is a, i think one of his more radical ideas that and this is, I think, also a good psychoanalytic idea that you can't know what you really are inwardly until you act and and realize yourself through an action. So so he he does it. He's very, very I think the pro, the philosophy he's most opposed to is the stoical retreat from the world. Right. He has the, all these incredible lines against the the like the meek monk who tries to get it to go back. Like he hates him. He hates him. Like for him, the ultimate insult is to call someone monastic, right? Like that's just the worst. But, I, and I think it's a nice point that, I mean, this touches on our sexuality discussion from earlier, but, and, and he also is, I don't, I, he's not the first because Rousseau had children out of his wedlock, but he was a, one of the earlier philosophers that had a child out of wedlock. A child out of wedlock, yeah, I approve. Yeah, yeah so, so he does have this kind of, but I, I think that he, I think he thinks that you find out what you are inwardly in your, in the way that you're acting in the world. I mean, Mac, it makes me think of that, what you say about, I think this is an inference in existence or something where you say, you know, you know, you most know about yourself in, the, in your, in the way you act sexually. I mean, he wouldn't have said it like that, but I think that that, that is in a, in a that is in the vein of what Hegel is thinking about inwardness. Because, I mean, because the way you act sexually, I, I, I would use that grammar, but let's, uh, uh, your sexuality is uh, central to your psyche. It, it, they right. are inseparable, and they're inseparable from your body. And so, you know, they like to say there are no lies in bed. Well, there aren't. So nobody can read the signs. Uh, right. But you right. give away, so and and you experience so much I had a time when I was trying to break free of Roman Catholicism where I was impotent. Well, you know, the the conflict had invaded my body and had and the voice of the condemning church had so much power 
that the anxiety level of being sexual was uncontrollable. Do you think Freud thinks it's possible to lie anytime? Uh, Let alone I, in bed? I, I mean, I, I think I, my answer I, would be no. No, I don't think he does. I just think that the sexual brings to a to a to a head, if you'll excuse a pun. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I, I told somebody recently because I've had this surgery, and it's, as you know, it's caused. I had my my uh, the thing that OJ just died of. What's it called? What prostate. did I take it prostate. out of? It? I had my prostate taken out, and it makes a lot of changes, Vanessa. Um, and uh, somebody would say, "Well, you don't look like you're up to it." I, I would always in that situation say, "Well, I just need a head start." <laughs> okay, enough of that. You can see why I'm a good reader of your novel, Vanessa. Wonderful. <laughs> but but is that really I, what OJ died of? He died of prostate cancer. Yeah, 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 yeah. It died died he of get the, he didn't died get of, the I, test. I, also having no soul. But uh, um but I want to get back to inwardness, if I can, for a minute, because I think we, I, I couldn't agree more. That, and, and that's pure Sartre, too. I am my act. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sartre is a warrior against any form of inwardness that, that, that gives you an out from being your action. But I want to still stick with the idea that inwardness, the word itself, uh, uh, indicates something inside you some relationship inside you i agree that it's going to be manifested in of necessity in action but i want to talk about that constitution of that inwardness i notice you've got a ton of kierkegaard right back here did you notice that? Uh, isn't uh, that all kierkegaard yeah that's kierkegaard, kierkegaard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and of course kierkegaard's big argument which he didn't understand a million things but i think he had a valid argument about Hegelianism. Uh, and, and his argument was that it completely deprives us of, of inwardness, or what he called subject. Right. He has the, I have a uh, question. It's kind of random. Have either of you read David Cronenberg's novel, Consumed? No, he wrote it. Is it about Kierkegaard? Or? It's That's Cronenberg. Novel. It's about, it, it has psychoanalysts in it. It's kind of set in the the time of like Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, like oh. like characters set set on those philosophers, and it has cannibalism. Oh wow! Because <laughs> it's he, not, he hasn't filmed. He hasn't filmed it. No, you have to read it. Wow. I, I <laughs> My husband not... got this for me when we first met, and I was reading it, and I was like, "This guy is really weird. Why did he give me this book?" Well, but of course, it's that. perfect. <laughs> yeah, but you yeah. went on and married him anyway. Yeah, so. how did he know that? <laughs> That's funny. I I didn't know. Of, I didn't know he wrote novels. I've I've I seen every one of his only one. Also, yeah. have you seen his son's films? Have you seen Infinity Pool? Yeah. I am yeah. obsessed with Infinity Pool. What yeah, a movie. Very good. Yeah. Infinity, Have you seen yeah. this one? You might like this one, Mac. It's a new movie, but it's good. It's Cronenberg's son, Brandon Cronenberg. Here's my problem. I live in a red area of our country. I'm surrounded by MAGA people. Oh. Uh, some of them know I'm here. Uh, no films like that ever get to this area. It no. Would not not get here. Yeah, my small town either. We have, our yeah. cinema gets only like the big blockbuster yeah. films, yeah. and it's like so, so sad. To wait. But it's now it's you can order a lot of these things right through Netflix and and stuff, and you get them in your home. So that's I'll look. Yeah, for that. I got Infinity Pool on Apple TV. Infinity. Oh, you did. Okay, I can get it that way. Uh, it's worth but it. To your the thing yeah. I want. To it is good. It's good. I, I mean, agree. Todd, Todd, what I. What I have again and again in my own experience, I find that I take things into myself and I develop a consciousness of them that in, in certain cases makes me make those things a part of who I am, if that makes any sense. All sorts of crap we take into ourselves and we get rid of it. But there's certain things that we, that, what I'm trying to say is uh, when I think of inwardness, I think of someone like Rilke, uh, where there's an inner process of attunement to something uh, in, 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 in the psyche that is uh, 
very different from all the other ways in which people sustain uh, experiences, memory, et cetera, uh, uh, everyday stuff. You you get all sorts of crap you take into yourself. I you know I I read a, a Donald Trump tweet a while back because uh, uh, and you know I take that into myself. I say fuck you you pig and that's it. It's out again. What I mean is, is there an inner uh, reality that that Hegel is saying is central to philosophy? That yeah, I, I think so. I mean, you're it's right like, that that's... Uh, uh, don't give me a philosopher who doesn't have inwardness. So, yeah. you know, I get rid of a lot of bricks. That's yeah. the analytical. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Every uh, who, Russell Wittgenstein would be an interesting yeah, question. Russell, yeah. Russell was interesting because he was very erotic. I, I started to him once, where he said, "He said uh, they said, what are the most important things in your life?" And he said, "Well, with the exception of the erotic experiences, which I won't talk about here, here certain experiences with mathematics have been almost as important to me." Wow, that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I would say like you're I, I, I absolutely right about so that Kierkegaard's main book where he launches this criticism is called Conclu Concluding yeah. Unscientific Postscript. Uh, and a lot of it's unfair. But I think, as you point out, I think a lot of it, it's not totally wrong. And there is this kind of sense in Hegel's thought that the inward is has less weight for him than the outward. But I think that there is this also and I think this is why you like this book more than the logic. I think uh, the phenomenology, especially in the preface, I think there's a lot about this, you know, that's where he has this famous line about uh, life of spirit, it wins to its truth when it finds itself utterly torn asunder. And then he says that it, it, its basic task is what he calls tearing with the negative. And so I think that would be, again, that would be how I would describe inwardness for Hegel it's like it's it's this being it's this feeling of being torn asunder and and the, and then and, and what he calls the the, the German word 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 is for violent so it's been differently translated by recent translators so instead of tearing they you said lingering and things like that but abiding but this this tearing with the negative I think is really for him that's what really constitutes my inwardness and I think that that's I find that pretty great. And I think that that all those things that are what Mac you described as like passing things you just kind of get rid of. I think those are the things that for Hegel would be the positive things. And then that like the negative is the oh, he's got the dog. Uh, oh, she's, 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 oh, she's that, getting pissed up. Okay, Emmy, <laughs> relax. That's so that's Emmy. what I would say. That's what I would say. Uh, yeah, there's there's always a uh, terms. Kierkegaard in, in the concluding non-scientific postscript talks about this passionate, passionate engagement in one's own existence, and he claims that that's what Hegel leaves out of his philosophy. I think he's wrong about that, but I think he's right about the the, the idea that, uh, and I think this connects with making drama rather than argument that. Mm -hmm. You can engage yourself uh, in ways that deepen your relationship to yourself. That, that to me is inwardness, that when I deepen my relationship to myself. Uh, and uh, what's, fasc what's always fascinated me about Hegel, uh, and I'm, I'm just remembering something the teacher I had for Hegel, I was a Sartrean at the time, and he said to me one day, and it, it, stu it stuck with me, he said, he said, sometimes I think, and very, he was very dramatic, sometimes I think that Sartre is no more than an abstract Hegelian. So my shit. Uh, yeah. He says, then I see the incredible insights into human conduct and the human psyche and stuff like that, and I realize I'm wrong. So uh, That's pretty great. Yeah, yeah. I think I ended up an apologist for John the 20s, whatever that guy who was there for 25 years. Fat Charlie, not John the Twenty Third. No, no, I mean the guy, the fascist, the right winger who was in there for for the Polish Pope. John Paul, that. John yeah. Paul II. Yeah, Karl Wojtyla is uh, yeah. his actual name, but uh, 
this guy, Kenneth Schmitz, ended up writing a book about, called The Center of the Human Drama, which is a philosophic study of Wotia's thought. And I, and I read it and I, I wept because this guy was a great professor. And then I saw him ending up an apologist for a reactionary Catholic who wanted to, to turn everything backward. Uh, let me throw it another way. I want you to talk, I still am wrestling with what you and or Hegel mean by the, well, he, Hegel doesn't have the term, but that doesn't matter, the unconscious and Hegel. Can you talk about that a bit? And relate Yeah, I just think that it, it, it has, relates to, sorry. I'm sorry, I, I want, I'm trying to get Hegel's contribution to psychoanalysis. Yeah, I think it's more anticipatory than anything. I mean, I, I don't, I, you know, I think that that's one of the, the he's just seeing like po pointing ways that Freud's going to develop that, that just weren't developed by, by anyone up to the time. But I think that, look, he doesn't have an idea of the unconscious. Like he just doesn't. Like he just doesn't. I, I don't think anyone before Freud does. So I think that's important. And I think like, but, but here's where I think he comes closest. This is what I'll say. I think it comes closest when he talks about the way that the what we do outstrips our idea of what we think we're doing, right? And so I think that's why drama is so important for him for thinking about anything conceptually, right? Because when when we see something in act, so like we've talked about the phenomenology a few times. So phenomenology is okay, we see something act in its action, in its drama, and then we see how, okay, like if there's a certain, a position has a certain idea about itself, but then it, as it acts, it, we see, oh, it didn't, like the idea it had of itself doesn't, isn't really realized in its action. And so I think this got me in a little trouble, this Hegel symposium I was at. I think that Hegel's point is no one in human history has ever been a stoic. No one in human history has ever been a skeptic. And so, when we look at these different positions, no yeah. one in human history has ever had an unhappy consciousness. I know this is gonna bother you the most. Uh, no one, in, so any, no one in human history has ever been an enlightenment thinker. Like no one ever has demonstrated pure why, faith. Why like, is, why is, what's that? Because why is, when we see them in action, like when we take what sto the stoic, when we show, the stoic as a drama of stoicism in action hmm? we see that it betrays yeah. its very idea of itself and so that that's what hegel's constantly doing i think and that to me is a beautiful kind of psychoanalytic i, I, I agree insight. strongly because i think that the, the the biggest lie anybody ever told and you tell it every day is that wasn't my intention well of course it wasn't your intention it was your deed and your deed right. outstripped right. your intention. In fact, your deed was right. usually the thing that refuted your intention. Uh, right. I mean, I think that this is what psychoanalysts taught. I mean, that's basically what the, uh, occupies the psychoanalytic session all the time. The, the, thing that, the thing that I've learned more from psychoanalysis than any other idea is that what you don't know about yourself is what you do for the other person. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how it comes back at you. That's how your deed outstrips this, your intention. That's the bullshit you want the other person to buy because it's a plea for excuses. For wanting yourself to buy. Or yourself. <laughs> I can it, right? then I, if I can be, BS myself about it, then I've really got it made. <laughs> uh, and when I was studying literature ages ago, they always said, well, what's the author's intention? And I kept reading books and they're saying, that's the least of what's going on here. Uh, the intention. Yeah, that's probably, probably why we don't like current movies and art too, because it's so yeah. like conceptual. It's too much like the ego trying to like say something. It's like, why don't you just like make, let your unconscious speak and see what happens. Uh, that's exactly right. And, and I think that might be Todd, what, what, where, where Hegel does have a genuine concept of the unconscious. So he doesn't call it that. That he's saying that all, and I'm just paraphrasing what you said right now, I think, that all action uh, is, uh, is not only outstrips your intention, is probably contrary to your intention. Yeah. 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 I well, mean, I mean, almost always contrary, right? Like, that's yeah. like, 
like just to take stoicism as his great just because he hated it the most like the stoic <laughs> thinks the stoic too. thinks that it's retreating from the world i mean then okay the question would be like does he hate it the most because it's the most proximate to himself right like that would be the, yeah. that would be the interesting question to him but the stoic thinks that they're that they're retreating from the world when in fact this is Tegel's point they get all their content of their thought from the world so yeah. they're not so their retreat is just it's fake right and yeah. so i think you're you're that really speaks to your point that not only is it your intention not realize it's actually probably the closer to the opposite i mean it's also fascinating that this idea of intention because for for the one of hegel's we've mentioned it before predecessors emmanuel kant like moral intention was the that's what counted right like yeah. you're you you're in fact he rejected any kind of responsibility for the result of your action right like you're only right. if you follow the moral law then you're, this is what this, this is this famous objection to him by this guy, this French guy, Benjamin Constant. And he said, you know, what if a murderer comes to your house and says, oh, do, are you hiding someone here? I want to kill them. Uh, do you yeah. have the right to lie to them? And okay. Constant's like, of course you should lie. And, and, and Constant's like, you know, actually, no, you can't lie because as long as you tell the truth, if they get killed, you're, you're not culpable. Yeah. But once you lie, and say you lie, they're not here, and then they're, they're sneaking out, and the guy sees them, then your lie actually gets them killed, then you are culpable. So it's really interesting that for Kant, intention is so yeah. paramount, but for Hegel, it's just, it's absolutely, just like Max said, it's not only meaningless, it's probably the opposite of what so it intention is. always wanting to limit my action. It's always saying there's a, maybe a, a whole aura of other things, opinions, attitudes, motives, conflict, you know, but I want to limit myself down to this thing, which I will take my stand on. Yeah. And uh, to demonstrate that that is itself, I would you start in bad faith or that it's contradictory is, is, is I think, I guess, I, I remember when I first read Hegel, I said, no one in philosophy has ever analyzed philosophic thought in this way. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find it. I could find it a little bit maybe in, in Plato and Socrates, but, mm -hmm. but only in anticipation. Here's a guy who is entering into it. What excited me so much is all of a sudden philosophy came alive as something that actual human beings were staking their existence on, and and at the same time lying to themselves. So that was the beauty. They, so I remember one of the conflicts then. I don't know if we use any of this anymore. People were accusing Hegel of pan logicism. Yeah. And people came to his defense and said, "No, it's pan tragism." <laughs> and and I think yeah. that has a lot more credence to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I so, think that's I think it's absolutely I right. Say, and yeah, that is. Beyond happiness of all thinking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's right. That's right. Yeah. I think the, this is also again, a good teaching moment though, just generally for people listening, because I feel like every analysis everybody I know at some point stays in a relationship with someone when the that's clearly like not working out so well because they're like well I don't think they meant to do that I don't think it was their intention to do that I don't think they wanted to hurt me etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's like yes but that's what they did and I don't think like yeah. many people consciously are like I'm gonna screw this person over like this but they do it over and over and over yeah. and over again I know yeah you, you know it's interesting I know like, about I, I, relationships <laughs> I, I I get in fights with my spouse, who's also a psychoanalytic theorist, about the opposite thing. Like I'm constantly saying, like she breaks a lot of things, like drops them, di dishes, cut, whatever. And I so if she breaks something That's that I loaded. really drops them, drops them, total accident, right? So I'm just like, look, I don't believe. Sorry, I don't believe in accidents. So she, that makes her furious at me because it's I like, don't either. Look, <laughs> Sometimes you just drop the dish, and I'm like, "Look, that was my favorite cup. You just, you just destroyed." Oh, yeah, and, so, and, <laughs> and so, but but yeah, so that's an interesting question. Masterpiece, right? I mean, it could work the other way. That's all I'm saying. But yeah, those are interesting because would you call that a symptom? 
Would you call it? Yeah, her? I think so. I think yeah. it's a, I mean, or an acting <laughs> out. Open <laughs> or an acting out. Yeah. 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 I don't believe but in it's, accidents. The one thing that I, I, I have learned to, the one way I've learned to kind of embrace it is to say, I think it's like a lack of like carefulness. Right, like it's maybe not. Maybe that's I think how she that's, gets her aggression out. These little drops. Well, right, that's interesting. I didn't think of it that way. I didn't think of it that way. I think she just doesn't care about the things that she that those thi like material things. Yeah. And so that she just doesn't value them. And so I actually think that I've kind of learned to see it as a good thing, not as a negative thing. But uh, yeah, it took a lot for me to. Well, now, to, now, now we get to <laughs> analyze you. Why did you? Why was I upset about it? Yeah, I mean, that's, why are yeah. you tolerant? Why am I tolerant? Well, that's a whole other question, I guess. Um, yes, it is. <laughs> I mean, you, you love the person, you're tolerant of their, I, of their thing. I guess, yeah? you know, it's an interesting thing because I think, and I'm not saying I practice this. I try, I'm trying to write a novel or two characters practice it. But I think love is maybe one of the least tolerant things that we should be doing. I don't think love should be tolerant. I think far too many couples say, if we love each other, I won't do anything that will harm you, that'll cause you pain and to cause you to look at things and you do the same for me. That is, their contract is really a contract of bad faith. Yeah, I get that. But let me oh, just, let me just add a little, God. let me just add a I'm little, sorry, I, don't, I don't know the, what's the, what is it? I always try to think. So in French, you, there's this word, um, like a, it's a musical flat. It's like a, but it's like a kind of an objection. You just, but it's not, it's like a bemol. I just want to add what it has. Like, like, I don't think there's an English word for it, but like not an objection, just a little slight, like a little flat. Like, okay. isn't it true that though you can, you can like when you love someone, right? That you have to see the way in which, the th and I think this is such a nice Hegelian idea. You have to see the way in which the thing that you, the thing that you value most about the person is inextricable from the thing that it also annoys you. Drives most you about. crazy. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so that, so I think that has to be part of your uh, thinking about love as well, right? Like you can't just, you can't, you have to, can you make the connection between like, again, let me just another, like in, in addition to the dropping, like my partner spouse leaves, Constantly leaving the light on, right? And so I'm like, look, it's just a lot of electricity. It's wasteful. It's a... But then I think, like, okay, how is that related? And it's, I think, directly related. Like, she just, she just doesn't. She's thinking more about other people, or whatever, than about the the obsessive thing about the light. She's just not obsessive. So I think that that I, I think that's absolutely crucial. So I don't know if that you don't want to call that tolerance. I don't know, but I think you have to see the way in which the that kind of dialectical connection. I, I, I'm going to pull a Marcuse on you here, critique of pure tolerance. I think we have all sorts of tolerance. I don't think we could get through an evening with another person without a great deal of tolerance about all sorts of little things. I meant tolerance about ways that we know that person is being on dishonest and unjust to themselves. Yeah, yeah. I, the, I hear you on that. That's no the thing that not yeah. be tolerant. And oh, I'm constantly calling out Carl about things. I'm like, no, but this, look, you're doing it. And then I apologize. Oh, I'm analyzing you. And he's like, yeah, but I married a psychoanalyst. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that means you, you just, see what you just did there? I, I, have, I, I have to ask Vanessa because you're over there. I'm watching uh, recently a Danish TV series called Borgen. You mm -hmm. know Borgen? Very good. And, 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 and it's good because the politicians all have screwed up relationships. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, 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 and yeah, I'm glad it's, it's a good series. It is good. The bridge is good. Too and it's like got the, it's it's a murder happens right on the line of the bridge that separates Sweden and Denmark and so both authorities get oh. involved. Oh yeah, that's yeah. That's a good one too. Yeah, was yeah, that remade as Tunnel? Vanessa? It has been made Tunnel. It there's a British version. There was an American TV series. Mm. So but it's, it's originally a, is it a Swiss or a Danish? 
the bridge one? The original one. Swedish. It's Swedish. Oh, it's both. Okay. Uh, they did the one. The one in t over here was set on the border of of, of Mexico and Texas, so it was perfect. Oh, cool! For, I think well, that's I have to check they, these out. That's why they, they killed it. They killed it after. You guys, you know that you're my last podcast before I go to America. I'm going to America in a week, oh, wow. and I haven't been in five years. Yeah. Isn't that wow. wild? And, and moreover, she's going to Florida. I'm going to Florida really? and New York. Very, That's because I'm from Florida. Person. Yeah, I know. But you know what happened to Florida, too. Otherwise, I would not go. Yeah. <laughs> Are you going to, you should vote. Can you vote early? I I can only vote in New York. I'm still registered in New York, uh, my address. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I, think, I think we're good in New York. Yeah. yeah, I think we're good in New York. We're never good in Florida. It's always a disaster. <laughs> Hence why well, this is, <laughs> the abortion <laughs> issues kind of might make it interesting. There. Oh my gosh! When I was a teenager, you could get you could get an abortion at age fifteen without an adult's permission. Like you didn't need your yeah. parents' permission, you could just get one. And, and then, I'm very glad I lived in those times and not yeah. in these times. What I want to say is, I, I'm so happy about that because it's none of their business. Yeah, exactly. And a fifteen year olds probably shouldn't be having babies, so if they want to. You know, do that, then it's probably a good idea. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I get in fight <laughs> sending the school board in, in my town because there's all these right wingers who are saying, You're doing terrible things to our children. They're talking about 17 year old kids and they're calling them their children who need to be protected from, you know, good God. Um, so I think we all ought to get emancipated around age 10. <laughs> uh, two more, Todd. I want to. I want to talk a little bit about what experience, and, and I'll give you a couple page references in the book, if that if that would be legitimate. The th it, it 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 always it, it the term seems to move around. It seems to have different meanings. At times, it's almost a Kantian meaning. I have an experience when when I use a category to you know blah 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 a, a, a knowledge experience. There's other experiences that are very different. And I'm wondering if if you've been too, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, too cavalier in the way you deploy that term. And the other one is 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 thinking. What is thinking? Uh, so if you can kick those around a little bit, that yeah, would yeah. I mean that's probably true about experience. I mean I I was I I, I honestly probably had you in mind as much as anybody when I wrote that. Uh, there's a chapter of why Hegel doesn't care about experience yeah, or something yeah. like that. Uh, uh, and, and, and Martin Heidegger wrote a pretty well-known book called uh, Hegel's Concept of Experience. Uh, and I'm, I'm pushing against that too. Uh, but yeah, I think that there's two ideas, like there's experience in the banal sense of like just what happens to us. And, and then there's experience in the sense of like this, what we've been talking about, this drama of, of, playing things out. And so I think, yeah, I probably do slip back and forth between those two well, uses of it. So yeah, I don't I don't have a good excuse for that. Where, here's where yeah. I think you're using it in a in a in a rich way. Uh, yeah. there's not you use it, you know, it's the way we all use it. Did you have an experience yeah. today? Yeah, I'm ordering a hamburger and I just took a photograph so I can show it to five hundred people so they can yeah. join in in the experience of me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But here you get, this is on page 123, each position that the subject takes up must be submitted to the travails of experience in which its contradiction becomes evident. And I guess what I, and I like that idea a great deal, yeah. but I'm not sure quite what you mean by the travails of experience. Well, I just mean what we've just been talking about there. That's exactly what I was saying. Like that, this drama of how something plays out, how it's, how it, falsifies its idea of itself, right? Like, so again, like skepticism can't really be skeptical, right? Like stoicism can't really be st stoical. And and how Hegel shows that is by this showing us what that experience of that thing would be like. But you're right that, that, that I do kind of vacillate back and forth between these two ideas of experience. One is just this ordinary, but you just said this banal kind of understanding and I, I yeah i mean I, I don't know what to say about that other than yeah i probably shouldn't have done that <laughs> but yeah, i do that anyway it's a great phrase 
the travails of experience. Yeah. Travails, yeah. I like I it. I think it's probably, I probably stole it from somebody. Well, all writing is cut ups. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> thinking. Oh, thinking. I didn't, I, I avoided thinking. Uh, I think for Hegel. Again and again, let me, let me preface a little yeah, bit. Yeah. I'm going to end up writing a preface against prefaces. Um, okay. I think frequently when we've uh, locked horns, uh, I've been trying to speak for one kind of thing. I'm not trying to prejudice this. And again and again, you, your response has been, well, I think. And then you present me with uh, a conceptual articulation. Yeah. Which is fine. But I'm still wondering what that act is of thinking. Well, I think for Hegel, it's to see. So I think this is, I keep saying, I think I'm, I, yeah, I'm, I'm doing it very. You end up with Yeah. Uh, but uh, I don't know how to, I don't know how to talk without doing that. So I don't know what All right. The only funny thing is when I'm writing emails, I realize that I've said it like in multiple sentences and then I just change up the structure because I'm like, you can't keep saying, I think that many times. Uh, but when you're talking, you just, this is why psychoanalysis isn't written. Uh, I, think, uh, I just said it again. Uh, but but my, my That's what you do, be, you think. My claim would be <laughs> that thinking for Hegel, and I think this is what, one of the things that differentiates him and, and, and marks his uniqueness and, and especially separates him from someone like Gilles Deleuze or someone uh, for whom thinking is inventing concepts, right? Like that's what, the, yeah. the, 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 and I think a lot of philosophers think that, that to think is to invent a concept. And I think for Hegel, it's, it's more, it's never invention. It's always discovery of what we were doing. This is why this connects us unconsciously to what we were doing without being aware of it. And thinking is just the act through which I become aware of what I was already doing or what was already going on in my head. What, and thinking brings this, this element of, of, of mediation or reflection to what was already happening unawares in my psyche. And I think that's, for, that's to me like the, so in a way, his way of thinking about thinking is I think incredibly radical and it really has infected me totally. Like I can't, I can't go to this other way of thinking as invention. Like I always, I like, we're not, like, I, articulating, Vanessa, you said, like speed. Right. Exactly. Like when you said like, Oh, filmmakers should go full more fall that like, I think they're too much caught up in this idea of being trying to be inventive. Right. And rather than just saying like, yeah. okay, what is it? I, what is it? I see what's going on. And just like, well, uh, find a way to get that to unfold right mm -hmm. and i think that's to me that's the again the gesture of thinking for me thinking is something i engage in when i have an experience which is shattered it shatters my framework because then i have to think because i no longer have the ways in which i think they have right. been they have been uh, uh, shattered and thinking then is is uh, it's certainly the opposite of invention. It's you have no idea where it's going to go. Mm. You're, you're yeah, but I think I yeah I think like that the is tech session you... would make you think. Yeah, yeah. We can always ask what what does make us think um, if we're thinking about our own existence. Um, it's some anguish. Uh, uh, that ha is so unsettling that it uh, I'm having trouble articulating this, but to, when you, when somebody says, I'm feeling that my existence is at issue in this situation. I don't think one should say that cavalierly because I think when your existence is at issue in a situation, you're in a life or death situation. You're in a situation where one of the very uh, one of the clear outcomes of the situation might be that you kill yourself. That's to have one's existence at issue. And 
when you have that, what's striking to me is that's the time when most people don't think. Uh, and I also think it's the time when most things that we consider to be thinking are no longer valuable. Um, I have a Mac third went there. Idea. I'm sorry. You I'm, went there. We're in yeah. sex and death here. Yeah. yeah. No, I think, <laughs> like, yeah. I guess yeah. that's really helpful, but I, I, yeah, go ahead. You want to say something? I just wanted to, it reminded me of my friend Stephen Lacey, whom you knew. And he always yeah. said, Mac does not teach Hamlet, Mac is Hamlet. And, and, <laughs> that's a very nice thing to say. And as you know, Todd, I've written a play, Hamlet at 80. With, I played Hamlet when I was young, Vanessa. And then I thought of it the rest of my acting career as that was the best part I ever had, but I really screwed it up. <laughs> you know? So I kept thinking, how would I do it today? I think most actors who play that part have that thing. So I finally wrote a monologue play where a guy is 75 years old and he's and he's going back, looking back over his whole career, and he's trying to see how he'd play it. Uh, and I performed that. Uh, and it's a tricky one to perform because if you do it right, by the time uh, you get, if you play it right, the audience will forget that you're 75. They will think they, you will become Hamlet for them. It's one way to face death. You guys have to say how you know each other. Okay, so for Mac those that was don't my, know. Oh, yeah, for the Mac was my, so I first met Mac playing basketball actually. So we, right. um, so graduate students and faculty members in the English department at Ohio State, would play three days a week would play basketball and Mac was a regular player and I was a regular player and I didn't I hadn't had him in class and he was a he was you know he's active good good player for a guy his age and uh better than me probably uh and a, a friend of mine Paul Eisenstein was in a seminar with him that was on Faulkner and then on a bunch of other writers the next it was like a double seminar one two different quarters and and I got to know and so through Paul he's like oh and he started to talk about what Mac did and kind of things he thought and and then I so I at basketball went to Mac and I said you know I this summer I was thinking of reading uh Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit and Heidegger's Being in Time would I could I do that as an independent study with you and he said sure and so that's how we met and so I finished my PhD work before I ever I never had a class. I had a, a lot of classes with Mac, but only after I was already a, writing my dissertation, not not while I was an actual. So none for credit. But then he was my then he was my dissertation director, and then he's been my friend ever since, since then. And we used to, you know, we'd go out to my friend Paul and Mac, and I were Mac's uh, partner lived in Michigan, so he had no in, and my girlfriend lived in they, they, they in Boston, Vanessa. You're right. We kept him chase. <laughs> and so we uh, we would we would go. We went to the movies and out to dinner on the weekend a lot. And so it was yeah. a really well, nice. I, I'm remembering was, right now when we saw Shortcuts. When the three of yeah, us. Yeah, we saw the film Shortcuts together. Yeah, we saw the movie. Yeah. and we, we wished that it would never end. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So, yeah, so brilliant. So that we. So we did a lot of. We saw films together all the time. We went out to. I remember the restaurants we used to go to. Eat. Yeah, so it was really, uh, and and. He was an amazing. Uh, everybody thought this in the English department. He's an amazing teacher, and and uh, just uh, you know he would come in to class with just a yellow legal pad, and he would just have little jottings down, and he would just he would just <laughs> lecture the entire class, like three hour class, whatever, on the basis of that legal pad. It's very impressive. I know I, I don't. That's not. Well, I remember one say, that's time not how I, you and I were walking to class, and and you said, uh, and Todd. Ta ta Todd was always a fascinating student, but there were certain things that he had that he assumed that that needed to be questioned. And it, at that time, he said, yeah, did you prepare for class today? And I said, I'm preparing right now. And he said, well, you don't have enough time. And I said, yeah, I got enough time. I got two minutes, right? I can prepare in two minutes. <laughs> yeah, my idea as a teacher, and and it was very much my relationship, especially to graduate students who were who were going to, my, my relationship was simple. I don't want you to do my crap. I want you to find your question, 
and then I'll try to complicate it for you as much as I possibly can, leaving you free finally to, you know, I have one regret about you and Paul, and they were roommates and they were pulling each other like two. Uh, had I known that the Lacan was going to was going to be as big a part of your development, I, I would have tried to be more uh, critical of it than I was. Oh, interesting. That's, yeah. a, that's, that's a regret yeah. I have, but I know you have. But Todd's sure. done okay, so <laughs> you did but a Todd good job, was... Mac. <laughs> <laughs> did I did yeah. I cross the line? No, 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 I said no, Todd's no, done no, okay, I... so you did a good job. <laughs> well, I think so because Todd has Todd <laughs> is one of those Lacanians, and you know there's different kinds in it, so it's it's very complicated stuff, but you have weaned yourself from much of it, Todd. And you and I think the book you wrote on Lacan recently is a wonderful introduction because it doesn't have the usual piety and obscurity that go hand in hand. I think frequently. We'll see. I, I could, I'm going to win. I, it's the I, like that. So Vanessa, so Cambridge. I was going to. He downplayed. So, very good. I'm go, I'm about to downplay. So uh, Cambridge asked Mari Rudy to write the introduction to. Jacques Lacan, I guess they don't have one. And she asked me to co-write it with her. I don't know why I thought you shouldn't ask, you should just do it, but she did. And then she died before she could finish any of her part. So they asked me to finish it. I finished it. And it's like it's like an anti-Dale Carnegie. So it's like yeah, how to how true. to men and not influence people. So it's gonna win me a lot of as, yeah. because the but exact I reason think, that makes it, I think that will be so good if you can sustain it and make it uh, go to conferences and, and make it part of a public uh, uh, display. I think that can be a wonderful thing. And certainly you have support. Rick is very supportive of, of your lines of thought in, the, in these things. And I think he would be the kind of person who would say, we're at a position with Lacan now that we can drop some of the, some of the deification and we can say, here's you know the kind of thing that they were saying about Hegel when I was first studying it. There's a thing Croce wrote, what is living and what is dead in the philosophy of Hegel? Not a very good book, but I think we need a book, what is living and what is dead in the, in the psychoanalysis of Jacques Lacan. Mm. And I think you could really, I'd like Todd to write a book about that. He already yeah. had since. Well, but, I kind of, but I, I, want Todd, I want Todd to write less books than he writes because I, 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 I want him to write a book. I think a, a lot of people, people want me to write less books. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's. I should write less books. People say this that. Brings me back to the real. I part. don't think so. I mean, unless it, you don't like doing it. No, I like doing he it. But I, I, I just he saw. Loves. I just saw Slavoj this weekend. He's like, "What are you trying to do?" Like, I think I was crazy writing these, but you guys, you're writing. <laughs> I like all your books. Every time I read them, I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." Like, I. Just, well, that's not. I, I like the way nice. you think. Mm -hmm. That's very nice. I have to. I have to go in a few minutes to a department meeting. So it's the opposite of thinking. So it's a, it's a I've banality. Felicity a while. Well, I'm yeah. so glad that we got to facilitate this discussion with you both. What we're going to well, try to do, I don't know if we, if we discuss this with you, Vanessa, so I'll just mention it. Uh, my novel will come out in about, it's the first of a five volume thing, but you got to get the first one out there. They won't, Publish the others. It's going to come out in about a month, and I invited Todd to interrogate it in a in a similar podcast. He's you're one of the two living people who have, who has read all of it, Todd. I know. I've I I been working on this thing so long. About four or five of the people who are reading it have died. <laughs> <laughs> He's in trouble. Although I had a dream the other night where the one guy he was there when the book came out. Uh -huh. in a couple of years and he was there and we were sharing and that was such a wonderful dream uh that's a great dream it, it was is. a wonderful figure and yeah. i'd be happy to host you two again you i would yeah. love you guys to be regulars yeah. uh, and 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 todd todd has he's he's the perfect reader for this book um uh, because the, well the other reader who's read all of it is my wife and she's a wonderful critic but there's limitations there you know? uh, I don't, I didn't, let me clarify that. There's limitations uh, to what she. Because she loves you. <laughs> She's very honest. She's very honest. I think she thinks too highly of me. I think that's the limitation. 
she because thinks she loves I, you. Yeah, she yeah. did. <laughs> yeah. get the, the law of the heart. That love thing again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She, she's a very tough woman. She's she's we we try to have the contract of of confronting each other as much as I can. I really think I I think she overvalues my work for a lot of reasons. Uh, and one of them is the affection. And it's also this bullshit that we try to work beyond that the woman feels she has to be supportive and yet we're we're beyond that crap and yet it sneaks in. And yeah, I think yeah, she's much it. closer in her <laughs> own way. She's She's got her own books, et cetera, uh, but she's closer to me. There's not a real antagonism. Todd and I are lucky in that there's an antagonism within our relationship. And that's what I think he can bring to 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 a discussion of the book. That that was my thought. Well, the great! Other... I'd be happy to host right. you. We can talk all about my America trip and yeah, catch up. I, it will be I fun. About that, I wanted one more thing about Todd. We used to play a lot of golf too, and Todd's a much better golfer than me. But he had a very interesting thing. Sometimes there'd be a two or three footer, and he'd putt it, and he'd miss it, and he'd say, "You gave me this one." Every putt, every putt in it, you gave me that one. <laughs> That's funny. Hey, Vanessa, thank you so much. Yes. You're welcome. Hey. Thanks for great. being here. See okay. you again soon then. Does anybody yeah. see these things? Bye. Oh, yeah. Okay, because I think they're going to think, gee, you people had a lot of laughs. Well, this stuff, yeah. if you can't laugh about it, uh, you know, that's part of the joy of it. Good to see both of you. Good to see Bye. you, Mac. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye.